we're talking about Yom Kippur and more on a deeper level what is going on on this very special holiday the day of atonement we all know that so question number one is why is this a day of atonement why does God forgive us specifically on this day and not some other day so the golden calf so if you do your counting the chronology of what happened the Jewish people at Mount Sinai the Israelites heard the Ten Commandments that was on Shavuot which is the sixth of Sivan and then Moshe went up Mount Sinai for 40 days to get the rest of it or to get the physical copy the tablets he was there for 40 days came down after 40 on the 41st day and then that was Yud Zayn Tammuz, the 17th of Tammuz, and he shattered the tablets because the people were worshipping the golden calf. Then he went up again for 40 days to discuss with God what happened and how we're going to deal with this catastrophe. Came back down and then went up one last time on the 1st of Elul, went up one last time for 40 days. And on the last day, on the 40th day, which was Yom Kippur, the 10th of the month of Tishrei, God said, I forgive the Jewish people. Moshe, of course, was defending them. Even though God told him, these people are sinful, let me erase them, and I will make a new people out of you. You'll be the new forefather of a new nation. And Moshe, of course, told him, if you erase them, erase me also from your book. So he wouldn't let them go. He was such a great leader. That's one of the reasons why he's such a, a model of leadership. No matter what, he wouldn't abandon his people, even though they were sinful and so on and complained all the time. He was stuck with them to the end and died with them to the end in the wilderness without even getting, without getting into the promised land. After all that he went through to lead this people for 40 years, he didn't even live to see the, the, the promise to enter Israel. So he died with them in the wilderness. So why is this the day of forgiveness? Because God it says that clearly in the Torah, that God forgave the people for the golden calf and says, henceforth on this day, God will always forgive us for whatever it is. Okay, so it's a day of affliction and a day of atonement. Okay. Now there's another interesting uh, uh, explanation for why it's a day of atonement in the book of Jubilees. Remember we talked about the book of Jubilees, which is not an official rabbinically accepted book, but it was a very popular book in the end of the Second Temple period. We find lots of the scrolls of this, even in the, among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it was definitely a very popular book. And uh, later Midrashim clearly quote from it sometimes. So the Book of Jubilee says something really interesting, that when the brothers sold Yosef, remember that whole thing? The sons of Yaakov, 10 of them sold Yosef down to Egypt. That's how the people came to Egypt, because Yosef went there, became the president, and then brought the rest of the family over. So the, when the brothers of the sons of Yaakov sold Yosef, and then they showed the bloody tunic to Yaakov and said, oh, look, he's, you know, your son's been killed. That day was Yom Kippur. That day was Yom Kippur. And so the Book of Jubilee says something really interesting. It actually says that on that day, Dina died, the sister, from her grief for losing her brother. And Bilha died, who was one of the mothers, one of the wives of Yaakov. And she died out of grief. And Yaakov, of course, was in huge grief and was constantly mourning after that for all those years until he saw Yosef again many, many years later. And the brothers felt so bad for what they did that every year, henceforth, they would mourn and cry on this day. Yaakov celebrated Yom Kippur as Yosef's yard site, basically. And they would beg God for forgiveness for what they did every day since. So the Book of Jubilees has that idea, which actually connects also to the rabbinic tradition. Because we have a tradition to read about the 10 martyrs on Yom Kippur, to read about the 10 rabbis who were martyred by the Romans 2,000 years ago. The Arugay Malchut. There was 10 big sages that were killed by the Romans. Rabbi Akiva was one of them and, and many others. He is probably the most famous one. And uh, if you remember that story of the ten martyrs, the Roman emperor invites them in and he, he arrested them. This is during times of war, the Roman Jewish wars. And the emperor or the governor, whoever it was, uh, arrested these rabbis and said, you have the story of Yosef, your ancestor, and the brothers sold him. They kidnapped him and they sold him into slavery. 
and they doesn't seem like they were ever punished for it. So he said, I'm going to punish you 10. You 10 are going to be instead of them because they should have been given the death penalty for kidnapping for what they did and they weren't punished. So he says, you rabbis are going to, I'm going to punish you for that, for their sin. I'm going to put you 10 to death. That's, and then they went to deliberate and one of them was Rabbi Ishmael and he went up to heaven and said, okay, let me ask God. Like, let me go see, let me meditate. Remember, these were great rabbis that could, Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva were able to ascend to the Echalot, to the, there's a book of Echalot, of how, to the heavenly palaces, describing their journeys through the heavenly palaces. So Rabbi Ishmael went up to the heavens to see what's the deal. And he says, yeah, this is from God. This is what God decreed. This is the tikkun. Spiritually, those 10 rabbis were like the reincarnations of those 10 brothers, and they were meant to die. But it's interesting that, you know, they were great rabbis. So, like, somebody who did the good, like, the, the brothers, we were reincarnated in great people. That's the tikkun. They became great in their next, in the future life. That's right. I mean, that's how it is. Sometimes people ask, well, why are good people suffering? Why do bad things happen to good people? And one of the classic mystical explanations is they're good now, but in a past life, maybe they weren't so good. And so they have to suffer for the sins of a past life. And the Arizal adds to that also that they were the same 10 souls that were the 10 spies that came out of Egypt. Remember the 10 spies that caused Israel to stay in the wilderness for 40 years? It was the same 10. So same 10 souls, the 10 sons of Yaakov reincarnated in the 10 spies, and then these 10 souls also in these 10 rabbis that were killed. And we read about it on Yom Kippur. So there's definitely a connection there with Yosef and Yom Kippur and what was happening. Uh, it's important to mention, by the way, when we talk about the brothers selling Yosef, did they actually sell him? No. Because we always say they sold him. The Torah makes it seem like they sold him. But did they, if you read carefully the verses, did they really sell him? It doesn't actually say that. Yeah, if you read the verses carefully, the brothers didn't really quite know what to do with him. They threw him in a pit. And then the Torah says that Midianites came and took him out of the pit and sold him to Ishmaelites. And the Ishmaelim, an Ishmaelite caravan, took him to Egypt. So if you actually read the Torah very carefully, verse by verse, it doesn't actually say the brothers sold him. They thought about selling him. Shimon said, let's kill him. Yehuda said, no, let's sell him. But while they were deliberating, he, he was taken by Midianites. And then meanwhile, Reuven went to save him. While the brothers were still talking, Reuven went to save him, and he was no longer there. He comes back to the brothers and says, hey, well, he's gone. And it, it makes it seem like the brothers didn't know that he was missing. How old was he? 17. This ha- he was 17 when this happened. If you read carefully, the Torah doesn't actually say that they sold him. But because they thought about doing it and they were about to do it, it's like it was their fault, like God blames them for it anyways. The fact that they even just threw him in a pit and even thought to do something bad, the Torah gives it to blames them as if they actually did it, even though they didn't. And that also explains why they didn't recognize him when they came to Egypt. If they were the ones that sold him to the caravan that was going to Egypt, they would have known that he's in Egypt. So when they later came to Egypt, they may, why wouldn't he be there? They would know, hey, we sold our brother to be a slave in Egypt. Maybe he's here somewhere. The fact that they were surprised to see him all those years later, and the fact that even though they mourned, they never went back to get him, is because they didn't know that he was there. So if we actually go with the pshat of the Torah, the pshat verses of the Torah, they did not sell him. And they didn't know what happened to him. That's why they never went after him. Even though they repented, they never went to try and find him because they didn't know where he was. And they probably did assume that he died. And that's why they were so surprised. After all those years, he recognized them. They didn't recognize him because they had no idea that he would be there. So that's important to mention. They didn't actually sell him. Next. Uh, the Midrash says a couple of other interesting things. In Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, it says that uh, Avram got circumcised on Yom Kippur also. How old was he? 99. He was 99. Itzhak was born a year later. He, was ni- he had 99 problems, but circumcision ain't one. Uh, so he was 99 years old. And we know this, uh, the idea that we have this, we talked about it last time, about the Satan. 
the Satan is the heavenly prosecutor, right? In heaven, there's a trial. Rosh Hashanah is a judgment day. There's a trial. The lead prosecutor is the Satan. And then there are defense angels on the defense side. There's angels on the uh, prosecution side. And Satan is leading the prosecution. Literally means the accuser. Satan is the accuser. He is the heavenly accuser. He is appointed to be the accuser. And uh, on Yom Kippur, that's his day off. That's the one day that he has off. So the Talmud tells this, says this, and it's in many other places, that the Satan has one day off a year, and the day his day off is Yom Kippur. And there's actually a numerical little formula for that, because if you do the mathema- the gematria of Hasatan, He is five, Sin is 300, Tet is nine, Nun is 50. So if you do the math, did you do the math? It's 364. So Hasatan, the numerical value of Hasatan is 364 because he works 364 days a year and his one day off is Yom Kippur. That's why he's 364. And the Midrash, again, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer actually adds something even better than that. The, it's a, the Midrash says not only does he rest, but on Yom Kippur, the Satan joins the defense. He crosses the floor to the other side and he actually helps on the defense team. So that's an interesting midrash. Are you so, supposed to be happy on Yom Kippur? Technically, yeah. Kippur? Yeah. So that Mishnah said in the Masachet Ta'anit that Yom Kippur is one of the happiest days of the year. Right? The, hap- the two happiest days of the year were Tuba'av and Yom Kippur. So it's definitely a really happy day because you're being atoned. You're, sin- you're a new person. Your slate is being wiped clean. But it's a very serious day. It's not Purim, although it's Yom Kippurim. But we'll talk about that later. It's not Purim that it's like a happy, like that, like a festival. It's a serious, very serious, somber day. But also it's a happy day because you're ultimately being cleansed. So it's a good day. Now, the Torah says that we have to afflict ourselves on this day. But it doesn't say how. What does that mean to afflict? How do you afflict yourself? Could be. Is prayer a punishment? <laughs> Maybe for some people. <laughs> yeah. Not eating. You're right. So there are five prohibitions. There's five things that you're not allowed to do on Yom Kippur. Five things. And why five? There are five because there's actually five times. So I'll read you the Mishnah. The Mishnah is what, where, what states this. It's in Masachet Yoma, which is all about Yom Kippur. Uh, so this is written 2,000 years ago, the Mishnah, chapter 8. So it says, Yom HaKippurim Asur Be'achila U'Veshtiyah. So the first thing you're not allowed to do is eating and drinking. That's together. And then, Rechitza. Rechitza is bathing. And then, Sicha. Sicha is anointing. To put, to put all kinds of creams and perfumes and whatever things and, uh, to adorn yourself. U'Veneilat uh, sandal. And wearing sandals, shoes, wearing shoes, and tashmisha mita, and being intimate with your spouse. So those are the five things that you're not allowed to do. So you can have a elaborate idea. Okay. You can work? No, no, that's separate. In, that's, on holidays, you're not allowed to work. So Yom Kippur is called in the Torah as Shabbat. So like any holiday, you're not allowed to work, of course. And all the things that that entails. Not working, not cooking. Just like any Shabbat, same thing. So just like on any Shabbat, it's a Shabbat. And these five things you have to restrict yourself in. So eating and drinking, bathing, anointing, wearing shoes, and being intimate. Okay, the shoes I don't understand. Like, so we're going to explain all that. We have to explain all these five things. Why five? If you look up the Bartanura commentary, the first, right away, he's the first commentary on the Mishnah. You look him up, Bartanura, not the wine. But the wine, today the wine is more famous. You say Bartanura, people know the wine. But actually, Rabbi Ovadia mi Bartanura, uh, the, Rabbi Ovadia was an Italian rabbi who wrote a commentary on the Mishnah, among other things. So he says, why these five? Because actually the Torah mentions Yom Kippur five times and afflictions on Yom Kippur five times. So corresponding to the five times that the Torah mentions the Yom Kippur afflictions, we have these five afflictions. Now, what's the deeper meaning behind that? To go. Why these five? Why five? Why these specific five? So now the Balaturim, another commentary on the Chumash, says like this. It says that the Chamesh Tvilot, the five immersions on Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, would immerse in a mikveh five times. 
כנגד חמש עבודות, או the hey עבודות, the five uh, prayer services, in that we, we, we pray five times on uh, Yom Kippur. So on regular days we pray three times, Shacharit Mincha Arvit. On Shabbat and holidays you have a fourth prayer, Musaf. And on Yom Kippur only, once a year, we have a fifth prayer, which is Ne'ila. Which, and the, remember, the prayers correspond to temple sacrifices. So the five services in temple times, today we have prayer services, they used to be sacrificial services. So the five immersions correspond to the five services. And uh, the Keneged hate filot, so the five prayers correspond to the five services, the sacrificial services correspond to the five immersions. Vehen keneged hei pa'amim melech akavod shebemizmor le'ashem ha'aretz umloa. So in one of the Tehillim that we read, God is mentioned, melech uh, akavod is mentioned five times. And lechaper ala nefesh sheyesh la, and this is the key part, lechaper ala nefesh to atone for the soul sheyesh la hei shemot, because the soul has five names and five levels. So if you remember, we talked about the five levels of soul before. What were the five levels? Your soul has five levels. You don't just have one. I mean, you have one soul, but it has various stages and levels and grades. So what is the lowest level of soul? What's that called? Um, the nefesh. nefesh. The lowest level of soul is the nefesh. The Torah tells us that animals have nefesh too. Nefesh is a basic life force. So even animals have nefesh. That's why we're not allowed to eat consume animal blood. We have to drain, if you eat meat of any kind, you have to drain the blood because the Torah says that the nefesh is in the blood. So we drain, it's the basic life force that's associated with the blood. So that's nefesh, that's the lowest level of soul. That's really just what's keeping you alive. Above that, what's the second level? Is the ruach. Ruach is the second level. Ruach means literally like air, wind, spirit. So that's what animates you. It's associated more with your vital organ, with your heart and your lungs and that whole breathing and cardiovascular respiratory system. So that's the ruach. And then above that is the neshama. Neshama is like the most important one. That's the one that's the most famous. That's you that's associated with your mind. With your mental faculties, it's, it's, this, it's seated in the brain. It's associated with the brain. So it's like your unique you. It's the biggest part of your soul. That's the neshama. That's three. And then above that is already a much higher stage that's uh, discussed much less. That the fourth level is called the chaya, which is associated with ones more. It already glows outside of the body. The nefesh, ruach, neshama are inside the body. The chaya is described as glowing outside of the body. So it's like an aura. And then the highest level of soul is the Yechida. The Yechida means it's the unique one. It's, that's your divine umbilical cord that connects you to Hashem directly to the heavens. It's the most secretive, most sublime part of your soul that most people never really even get to experience. But of course, we all have it. So the, the, as an aside, the, one of the reasons why we have, when we pray, we have a kippa and a talit. You have two layers of covering, actually, because they correspond to the, those two layers of soul that exude out of the body, which is the chaya and yechida. So they correspond to those two, that, to those two auras, let's say. Okay, so those are the five levels of soul. Nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, yechida. So the Balaturim already is telling us that the five afflictions on Yom Kippur and the five prayers of Yom Kippur correspond to the five levels of soul, which we are purifying. We are atoning for that. We are purifying all five levels and atoning for the sins that have contaminated those five levels of soul. So five, five, five. So now we have to, of course, connect the dots and, <laughs> and see how they connect to each other. Which of the five prohibitions would correspond to nefesh. So each of these afflictions is afflicting the soul. Right? So which affliction would be the hardest on the nefesh? The nefesh is your basic life force. That's what keeps you alive. The food and water. Why? Makes sense. The food and water is what keeps you alive. You can't live without food and water. That's what keeps your 
keeps you alive. That's what keeps your soul attached to your body. So that connects directly to the nefesh. So abstaining from food and drink is an affliction on the nefesh. It purifies the nefesh, which is what keeps you alive. That's what keeps the food and drink, keeps your soul attached to your body. It's your basic life force. That one's easy to understand. What about the next one? The next one requires a little more thinking. What would correspond to the ruach and what is, how does that? <laughs> ruach is your, your spirit. Your, where does ruach appear, the word ruach in the Torah? Where, all these terms, of course, are from the Torah. Nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, yechida. That was the neshama. Good, good. How do we know? <laughs> Where does it appear? It's right in the second pasuk, the second verse of the Torah. Right? That's the first two verses of the Torah. So the first time the word ruach appears is right in the second verse. It says ruach Elohim, the spirit of God, merachefet al pnei hamaim, is hovering over the waters. So there's a very deep connection between spirit and waters. Right? So that corresponds to the rechitza, the washing, bathing, immersing in water. Sefer Yetzirah talks about the connection between ruach and maim. Actually, it says that maim, very deep secret. Sefer Yetzirah was written down 2,000 years ago in the Second Temple era and dates back even earlier. And it has a really a profound secret because it says that maim comes out of ruach. That water comes out of air, out of wind. So if you read that 2,000 years ago, that would be very mysterious. Also, but think about it even scientifically today. What, what makes up water? Hydrogen and oxygen, right? Quite literally, you have two gases, two forms of wind, let's say, air, that combine to make water. So Sefer Yetzirah already said this, when God created the world... First, there was only godliness. You know, there was light, godliness. And then it says the first thing that God made, Sefer Yetzirah says, is ruach. So 2,000 years ago, that was mind-boggling. It's still mind-boggling. But today we know scientifically that that's true. Because what is the first element that formed in the universe? According not to Torah, according to science, the first element that formed in the universe is hydrogen. Right? Hydrogen gas which then makes up water. The word hydrogen literally means water maker. Hydrogen. It makes water, right? <laughs> so that's where the name comes from. So again, we see how science is catching up to these mystical secrets that we had already thousands of years ago. Now we can really understand empirically, scientifically, that yeah, that's exactly what happened. That the first element that God made was hydrogen, you know, these first elements. Shortly, I mean, eventually all these other elements formed. Oxygen came not long after that. If you look at your periodic tables, they're not far away from each other. And hydrogen and oxygen combined to make water. So now we can really understand Sefer Yetzirah, literally, that water comes out of Ruach. And Ruach came out of the original uh, energy of creation. So that corresponds to, there's a deep connection between water and Ruach, bathing. So that corresponds to the Rechitza of bathing. Okay. And if you, me if you meditate about on that a little bit, it'll, it'll actually make sense. If you think about even on the most, um, what's the word? Physical, like vulgar level. Why do you bathe regularly? What's the, like, your main reason for bathing? Yeah, just to wash away your sweat, essentially. To, to, and why do you sweat? Because... What animates you? Remember, what is your animating force? It's the ruach. The ruach is what allows you to move, like the wind. That's why it's called wind. The nefesh keeps you alive. But the ruach is what actually allows you to move. And that's why it's associated with heart, lungs, muscles, and so forth. It's your animating force. And the, the action of motion makes you then want to go and bathe, right? So even on the most physical plane level, the two are linked together. 
right? why ruach would correspond to bathing. Yeah, makes sense? Then you have the neshama. What would that be? That's your most biggest, your main soul. That's your you. That's your mind. That's your, who you are. Where does neshama appear in the first time, for the first time in the Torah? With uh, Adam, with the creation of Adam. The, the first time the Shema appears in the Torah is when God created Adam. And it says that he blew the Neshama into, his, into him, through his nostrils. He gave him a Neshama, a unique human soul. And in the image of God with, with godly faculties. So that was the Neshama. And then what happened? And then Adam was alone. So then God split him and made for him a Ezzer Kenegdom. So he took his neshama and split it in half. That's right. That's right. So your soulmate, we know we have soulmates. It's a very Jewish idea. The Talmud already said this 2,000 years ago, that 40 days, we mentioned this a bunch of times already, that 40 days before you are conceived, God takes one soul, splits it in half, puts one in a male body, one in a female baby, and says, okay, now you come together. Hmm? Exactly. Exactly. So your soulmate is linked to you specifically on the level of the neshama which makes sense, on, on the most deepest kind of level, on the biggest level of soul, attached to you kind of mentally, emotionally, in your intertwined, in your brain, your brains are connected, your minds are connected as one. So your soulmate is, with your, is your neshama connection. And so corresponding to the neshama, you have the prohibition of tashmisha mita. So that's an affliction on the neshama. And so sexual intimacy also... The, the pleasurable aspect of it is, a, is attached to the neshama. Because where is the pleasure of, the, of tashmish? It's not in the reproductive organ. Where do you feel the pleasure of the tashmish? It's in your brain, right? It's, it's a flooding of hormones and neurotransmitters in your brain. The Arizal talks about this. So the production, that whole thing is in your mind. Even the production of seed begins in the mind. The Arizal talked about that a long time ago. Today we know that's true, again, scientifically, because it really starts in your pituitary gland and your hypothalamus, and the hormones go from there down to the reproductive organs to generate seed. So that's the neshama, which is seated in the brain. So the neshama corresponds to the soulmates, corresponds to the tashmisha mita, that prohibition. Make sense? The Chaya, your aura. So that's your Zeh, external. Zeh, Sicha, why? Because that's the aura and you... That's right. And you and Very it. simple, exactly. When you adorn yourself and you anoint yourself, it's to beautify your outward appearance. So and that corresponds neatly to the Chaya, which is that part of the soul that exudes out of your body, to your aura. It's your glow. And, of course, anointing yourself is all about making yourself glow, so to speak. So that, that corresponds. So uh, the prohibition of sicha is an affliction on the chaya and a purification of the chaya. And finally, we get to the trickiest one, which just seems to me like, seems like it doesn't, what? Like the highest level, the highest level of purification for the highest level of soul, the yechida, is neilat sandal. Right? <laughs> not wearing shoes. Leather. Today we say not wearing leather shoes. Okay, Originally so it meant not wearing shoes, so period. People didn't wear shoes? Right. On Yom Kippur it was not wearing shoes, period. Is it because you're supposed to be grounded to the, grounded to the earth? So let's see. Let's see. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good hypothesis too. Uh, we get it, by the way, uh, from there's a pasuk. Let's see if I'll find it. I don't think I recorded it here. Uh, anyway, the Talmud talks, says where it comes from. There's a pasuk where it talks about King David mourning. It was Yom Kippur, and he was without, uh, without shoes. Uh, but what is the whole idea of not wearing shoes? And why does that correspond to the highest possible level? Can you say something? Yeah, the first time that God revealed Moshe. That's right. That's right. When God came to Moshe, or, or Moshe found God at the burning bush, God told him, Shalna alecha me'al raglecha, right? Take your shoes off. So there's something about removing your shoes, and it's not the only incident in Tanakh where a person's told to take off their shoes in the presence of God. 
of godly energy or of angels. So there's something about removing the shoes. Why is that? So the Zohar actually says that that you are without shoes like the angels. Now what does that mean like without, angels don't wear shoes apparently, but what does that mean? Why don't they need shoes? Well, they're not really walking. Yeah, they're more like flying. Yeah. If you remember Yechezkel, and many of the prophets saw the angels. Yechezkel describes them, Ezekiel chapter 1, the Haftarah and Shavuot. He describes them in the most detail. And he says that it's like they had like as if one foot, right? And it looked like a certain way. He describes it how it was, and it definitely didn't wear shoes. So it was without shoes. And that, in that way, it's like resembling the angels. It's also an affliction in the sense that it's not comfortable to walk, and the Talmud talks about this a lot. Is it like really not wearing any shoes? Or is it, what if you wear like tattered shoes, tattered shoes or whatever, because walking outside, like ripped up shoes that are not so comfortable. You know, would that be okay? Ultimately, the, the halakha is not to wear leather shoes because back then that would have offered you the most protection when you walk and you wouldn't have, like if you were stepping on stones and twigs and things. Right, so leather shoes would have been the most comfortable and the most protective on the foot. <laughs> yeah, those are very dangerous. That's pikuach uh, nefesh. <laughs> there's also a debate of the, the, the phrasing is ne'ilat hasandal, which means ne'ila literally means to lock. So the question is like, are the shoes locking shoes? Do they lock over your feet or not? Like if it's just like slippers, if they can slip right off, then maybe that would be permitted too because they don't lock over your feet. So they don't offer that comfort and protection. So that's already later debate. The original meaning was to be completely barefoot. Okay, we see that from Sukim in the Tanakh, we see that from the Zohar, and the angels being as if barefoot. Now the Arizal talks about this the most, and he talks about this in terms of angels are able to ascend through various worlds. We move from place to place with our feet. Our feet move us from place to place. And the same thing with the angels, it's as if their feet move them from world to world. So the idea of like taking off our shoes is like resembling the angels and then that thereby being able to ascend to higher and higher worlds. That's kind of the idea, the metaphor of the taking off the shoes. And it's, there's an irony there because the lowest part of the body is allowed to as if take you up to the, to the highest levels. That's the, the idea of the taking off your shoes and being pure before God and, you know, and be as if being able to ascend, to fly up into the air to transcend, to traverse all the worlds. And with shoes in this world, we use shoes to walk on the ground. But the idea is that not walking in this physical world, but ascending to the higher worlds where you don't need to worry about wearing shoes and stepping on things and so on. So... In general, we have four worlds, four dimensions, four... Uh, planes of reality. So we're in the lowest one. It's called Olam Asiyah, just the physical material world. Above that is Olam Yitzirah, which is more of like the world of angels and so on, which is superimposed on this world. And above that is Olam Abriyah, which is the, the furnace room of the world. That's the, basically where all the, the mechanical stuff, the, the, all the letters and numbers and equations and uh, the coding that the world stands on, so to speak. Right? Bria means that this is what creation stands on. It's really the spiritual foundation of the physical world. And then the highest world is Olama Atzilut, which is just pure godliness. And it's, this world is like, it's just like layers of condensed godliness. So at the highest level, it's just pure divine light. And then you condense that, and then Olama Bria is the code of existence. And then out of that emerges Yetzira, all the souls and angels and spirits, and then condense that even further and you have the most material world below. When you say world, do you mean do you apply universe? Do you apply yeah, it's a dimension universe? of this universe. It's superimposed upon us. So it's here. Oh, so the Hasidim would say Olam Atzilut is also here. Like it's all here. You know, it's all, they're all superimposed on each other. So the, there might be angels in this room right now and they might be moving through Olam Yetzirah, and then they can pop into Asiya because they have that ability that we don't. And if you attune yourself, you can see those worlds. So the Alter Rebbe, who was the first Chabad Rebbe, 
the, the one that we all know is the seventh Chabad Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, he had a famous letter that he wrote to his nephew towards the end of his life. And he wrote that he had gotten to the point, this was a private letter, this is not something he wrote in a book, this was a private letter that we have today. And he wrote to his nephew, he said, I no longer see a table or a lamp or chairs. He says, all I see is the divine letters of creation. He was seeing on the level of Olama Briya, like Neo in the Matrix, you know, at the end where he sees just the code. You know, you remember that? Remember the Matrix? <laughs> where he sees just the green code. That's how the Alter Rebbe said that 200 years ago. He said, that's what I see. And he wasn't the only one. Many, many other rabbis spoke in this way as well, that they saw the literal foundations, spiritual foundations of the world. They could see through the material. So those are the general. And then there are other worlds. There are worlds of angels. There's worlds, there's seven layers of heaven and all that. And the Talmud talks about what's in each layer of heaven, where these angels are, where those angels are. Where's Satan? Where's all these other? Michael, Gabriel, all, these are all angels. Where are they? Where do they reside? Where do the spirits reside? So there's all kinds of worlds out there. So that's the Neilata Sandal is on the highest level. In fact, one of the main angels, by the way, in, is called Sandalfon. That's not his actual name. But uh, that's the, the, we have various kind of Greek sounding names to the angels because the rabbis didn't want people to use their real names. Uh, we do know their real names, but they're kind of like colloquial names are like Sandalfon, Metatron, we talked about these names before. Those are not their real names. Uh, that's why they sound so Greek. They just use like the local languages that they spoke. And uh, Sandalfon means literally like, comes from the Greek meaning Sin Delphi, like a brothers uniting together, praying together. But Sandalfon is the angel of prayer who kind of like records the prayers, takes them up to heaven. And so there is the Arizal discusses the connection between Neilata Sandal and Sandalfon and Neila, the final, pra- the final prayer of Yom Kippur. Remember, each of these restrictions afflictions, cores- souls, corresponds to one of the prayer services. So we start with the Arvit in the evening, Shachrit, Musaf, Mincha, and then the final prayer is called Neila. So of course that corresponds to Neilata Sandal. Yeah. And then the angel Sandalfon takes up all those prayers up to heaven, and the, the gates are going to be locked for good, and it's the final judgment is, is sealed at that time. Three more interesting points, and I'm done. Point number one, this is a common question, not so common anymore, but one of the important questions that our sages ask, the Torah says to afflict yourselves. How do we know that we shouldn't physically afflict ourselves? You know, like some other religions, they'll like self-flagellate, for instance, they'll take sometimes even sharp things. I'm sure we've seen these videos of certain religions who shall not be named that smash their backs with like metal knives and even hit children on the head and they're all bleeding and it's like chaos. Uh, aside from just logically that's insane, why do we not do such things? Well, we should why should we not actually physically afflict ourselves? All that we do is we abstain. But that's, why not physically hurt yourself? It says we're not hurting, like hurting ourselves. That's true. Generally, you're not supposed to like harm your own body. The rabbis actually derive it from the verse itself. Because it says that, the, the Pasuk says, In the seventh month, on the tenth day, it says, Afflict your souls. And do not do any work. So, of course, the simple meaning there is, like a Shabbat, don't do work. Like you're not allowed to work, like on Shabbat. But the rabbis say, no, because it says don't do anything, it means like don't hurt yourself also. Right? Like don't actively... The juxtaposition of ta'anu et nafshotechem v'chol melacha lo ta'asu. So it's saying, yes, afflict your souls, but don't do anything to hurt yourself. Right? Just afflict yourself through abstention. So that's an important thing to mention. That's point number one. Right, it's a spiritual thing. That's true, exactly. It's not, you shouldn't be hurting your body. Your body. Don't take it out on the body. Okay, the second thing is, there's a, another beautiful statement of the Balaturim that we quoted before. He says that, Bizchut avodat yom kippurim hayu notzchim b'milchama. That because of specifically doing the Yom Kippur services properly, that was a sgula to win wars. That the Jewish people are stronger in battle because of Yom Kippur services. So that's important to keep in mind now and always. 
that we should give it 110% on Yom Kippur because that gives strength to our soldiers even today. Yeah, and that connects to what is the most miraculous war in Israel's history is the Yom Kippur War, for sure. Israel was completely unprepared for that, was attacked uh, pretty much unaware, or so we think. I mean, maybe the cabinet was aware, but didn't do anything about it, the Israeli government. And at first it started off as a massive catastrophe for Israel, but then it turned into a victory. And there were many miracles in this war, incredible miracles. Uh, So one of those miracles is in the, if you've heard of the Valley of Tears, the Valley of Tears is in the Golan Heights where the Israelis were ho- holding off the Syrians. And the Syrians had, at one point, as many as 1,000 tanks, for sure at least 700 tanks, Syrian tanks, against Israel originally only had about 150 tanks against 700-plus Syrian tanks. So it was already a mismatch. And they just fought for a very long time. Israel got them down to, it went down to Israel, seven Israeli tanks against 150 Syrian tanks. And at that point, they were ready to surrender. And the commander of the, over there of the IDF was Avigdor Ben Gal. That was his name. And he was about to radio in saying, we're surrendering, it's over. And then the Syrians just retreated. They turned around and retreated. And then the Israeli reinforcements came, and they actually went into Syria. And they went to the outskirts of Damascus. So... He was credited, Ben Gal, with saving Israel, because if he wouldn't have done that, it would have been over. Uh, but it was a complete miracle. And uh, when they asked some of the Syrian soldiers, what happened? Why did you retreat? So they, some of them reportedly said, we saw angels. We, just, we saw this whole multitude of angels coming towards us. Yeah, some people don't believe that. Some people say it's because Golda Meir phoned Damascus and said, we're going to nuke you if you don't retreat. <laughs> but uh, we don't know the real story. I do know uh, somebody that, a veteran, I think even maybe you were there when, when he said it, a veteran of the, who was over at my house for Sukkot from Israel. He was visiting, he was over at Sukkot. He, he was there in 1973. He was an Iraqi Jew, so he spoke Arabic. And uh, he was in the, on the other side, on the Sinai. And he said his job was he was just watching the prisoners of war, the, what, the Egyptian soldiers that they captured. And I asked him, I'm like, do you believe these miracle stories that happened during the war? And he said, of course I believe them. He said, I witnessed them. Right? So he said that he, as an Arab-speaking Jew, they posted him to watch the Egyptian soldiers because he could understand them and he can relay intelligence because they, they wouldn't realize, the Egyptians, that he can speak Arabic fluently. And he said that the Egyptians, he said, couldn't believe he overheard them talking about how the God of Israel is fighting for them. Their God is saving them. He said that the Egyptians were shooting rockets over the Suez Canal into the Israeli positions. And this person that I spoke to who was there said he saw the rockets just falling left, falling right, falling left, falling right. Nothing was hitting them. Right? And then they all felt like it was an absolute miracle. It was like they had an iron dome of God's iron dome before the actual iron dome in 1973. So I heard it from an actual veteran that was there, that there were such miracles. And it was in the merit of Yom Kippur. There, that's, that's what the Balaturim is already telling us this hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that it's in the merit specifically. So we win, and so that's another reason to be very focused on Yom Kippur. And the final thing, and I'll end with this, in the Tikkun Ezor it says, this is a famous thing that we've all heard, but this is one of the sources for it. It says, Purim itkriyat al shem Yom HaKippurim that there's a connection between Purim and Yom HaKippurim, that it's like Yom, the Torah calls it like Yom Kippurim, that it's a day like Purim. So one, one reason is because, yes, it is a happy occasion because we're getting purified on this day, but also the Tikkun Ezor continues and says the Atidin Leit Angaber, that in the future, in the world to come, Yom Kippur will become a festival like Purim, and we will delight on Yom Kippur like on Purim. And and it'll change from a day of affliction to a day of delight, of pleasure. That's right. So in the messianic age, uh, that will be, it will no longer be a day of affliction. It'll be a happy day uh, and a, a, f- a festive day. And that, that's how the passage there ends. So that'll, be, that'll happen in the time of redemption. Um, may it come soon. That's how it ends. So we'll end there as well.